Well, so I have a confession to make, which is um, this paper was really late in arriving to my colleagues and is only half done. And so what you're going to hear is much of the thoughts that are in my head about this uh, as much as those that are on paper. The history stuff is pretty, is, is moved along pretty well, but the rest of it isn't. Um, I hope that doesn't spill. So I'm going to wind up keeping this in my hand. Um, the, the, the first thing to think about is um, this question here. And it's one of the reasons why I decided to do the paper, um, apart from the fact that I'm uh, not just knee deep, I'm neck deep in uh, three different cases, all of which involve, two of the three involve um, very strong elements of racially disparate policing in the city of New York. Um, there was a, a colleague of mine gave a talk um, not too long ago at Columbia about, and this is one of these typical law school faculty workshops, and um, it's a paper about incarceration for the most part, and try to explain some of the phenomena about incarceration. And um, the paper was 61 pages long, um, talked in some detail about things like the super predator phenomenon and all these scary topics, some of the same kinds of, some of the kind of underlying cultural currents which animated some of the eras and phases that Michael talked about. Um, and never mentioned the word race once, um, which I thought was astonishing. And uh, so I go back and I get the paper and I search the paper for the word race, it's not there. Um, I search the paper for the word black, it's not there, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I thought this was remarkable. How could you possibly talk about incarceration in the US without talking about race? Um, there was another example, which is that if you read the opinion for law professors here in Kimbrough, Kimbrough v. US, um, Kimbrough was the case where the U.S. Supreme Court decided that federal judges could, oh, fantastic, thank you. I knew this was a modern law school. Um, so Kimbrough was the opinion where the, where the Supreme Court decided judges could depart from the federal sentencing guidelines. Uh, but Kimbrough had another very strong theme to it, which was basically saying everything we understood about crack cocaine, which gave rise to the 100 to 1 sentencing disparity, was wrong. All of the science um, about instant addiction, crack babies, this and that, uh, without getting into the sordid details, they said we're wrong. And therefore, we're going to change this around. So I start thinking, oh, this is you know, going to have something to do with the 100 to 1 disparity. And crack, of course, is more skewed towards African Americans and to a lesser degree Latinos than it is to whites. So I start reading the opinion. Um, and there's nothing in there about race. Uh, it was kind of shocking. There were two mentions of race, one in the text and one in a footnote, um, neither one of which acknowledged the racial disparity in incarceration. Um, the one in the text talked about delegitimation um, the fact that for the African American population uh, in the US, there was a problem with respect to the legitimacy of the law if we perpetuated this disparity and so on. And the other in the footnote was something inconsequential about a footnote having to do with something having to do with uh, some of the pieces of research. Um, so I thought this was really remarkable. And, and I started to ask myself, why can't we talk about race? And I, you know, I think these are some of the things that come up when we think about this question. Um, it's, we don't really have a language for it. Uh, we can talk about race. Um, we, you know, my colleague Kimberly Crenshaw is very, very um, uh, insistent that we use particular terminology in speaking about race. Uh, but people are a little bit uncomfortable, don't know how to take their cues in thinking and talking about race. Um, and the fact that race has a very long historical legacy, which is one of the points in the paper, and uh, creates an arc not just from 1975, but perhaps from 1775, maybe even 1675 uh, to 2025, um, is part of that historical arc that where we just don't have that language. Second, maybe we just don't have interest in it. Um, maybe there's just not terribly a lot of interest because we think we've solved these problems uh, because we have made strong advances in racial equality and before the law and so on and so forth. We have a Voting Rights Act and all kinds of things, and employment discrimination bans, et cetera. So maybe we just don't think it's a big deal. Uh, maybe we think it doesn't matter empirically or theoretically. If we focus only on the correlates of race, we never really have to talk about race. We talk about poverty, 
could talk about bad neighborhoods, we talk about broken families, we could talk about low education, we could talk about everything under the sun and substitute all of those, those um, uh, correlates for the actual talk about race. But I think that's a bit of a gamble uh, because it assumes that we can explain all of the variants, for the social scientists in the room, about any phenomena involving crime and justice simply by looking at the proxies rather than looking at the factor. And that's a big gamble and I think what the data show is that that gamble is probably wrong. And you know, to, to follow some commentators in the popular press and also um, I guess everywhere if you think of the Randy Kennedy versus Glenn Laurie debates, um, are we in a post-racial era? No, we're not in a post-racial era, but we like to congratulate ourselves and think we are. So um, maybe this is what we do. Um, or maybe we've just simply, as Andrew Tazlitz says, who's a law professor at um, Howard University, uh, we've just simply um, uh, instilled in ourselves a sense of racial blindsight. We willfully decided to blind ourselves to race and talk about anything but while we're actually acknowledging that the large share of the prison population in the US, the large share of the people who come in contact with the police every day, and a variety of stages in between, there's a racial disparity that starts at the front end and accumulates over time. Um, so you really have to do a pretty good trick on yourself to make that blind side work. And that's one of the things that we talk about, that I talk about in the paper. Um, so there's lots of reasons not to talk about race. We don't want to make, make, think that people are just simply burying their heads in the sand um, in, in an ostrich-like fashion. Um, maybe we can say crime rates are higher so we don't have to worry about race. Um, this is, um, to use the language that Phil hearkened to this morning, it's not our problem um, as a majoritarian matter. It's really a small problem predominantly of a population that's somewhat different than us. Um, there are higher crime rates, so we just wash the question away with the higher crime rates. That's one way to think about it. Um, there's not a lot of incentive for academics to write about race. If you're labeled as a race man or a race woman, you tend to get marginalized. Um, your work is not featured quite as prominently as it might be in other, if you did other kinds of work. There are people here who write about race, my two Minnesota colleagues, um, who've written about race with some discomfort, um, and they've taken a certain amount of heat for it, and uh, Barry and I have talked about it over time. Um, I get away with it, I suppose, because I talk about race and policing, or race and juvenile justice, or race and this, or race and that. If I talked about race and crime, I probably wouldn't get away with it in the sense of having some kind of academic standing. So there really is a pretty strong institutional disincentive among academics to really push on this question and push hard, and to push on it in a fairly uncomfortable way. Um, and the Supreme Court basically doesn't want us to talk about it. If you read a case like Wren, Wren is a racial profile, it's a car stop case, Fourth Amendment case. And in Wren, basically the court said, it's okay, right? We can do, you can stop somebody on the basis of race so long as there is um, some other reason to make the stop. That reason can be pretextual. If you want to do race, that's fine. And in a case like Wardlow, we talk about, we do the bait and switch. We talk about high crime neighborhoods instead of talking about people or neighborhoods where are particular racial concentrations. And we get away, we scrub race out of the picture. So um, the Supreme Court basically doesn't give us a whole lot of incentive to think about it and to talk about it in any detail. Um, and one of the reasons why it's hard to talk about and why the Supreme Court may not want us to talk about it is that it leads us to a very uncomfortable conclusion. We're engaged in a practice that is unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment and probably under an awful lot of state constitutions in the country. Um, April 22nd was the 25th anniversary of the McCleskey decision. Uh, McCleskey was notable in a number of ways. One was Justice Powell's recantation, uh, where he said, if I had, it to do, if I had one do-over, that would have been the one, uh, which would have banned the death penalty. We wouldn't be having to have a conversation about death. But also, McCleskey said, when confronted with evidence presented by David Baldus about systematic racial bias in the identification selection of cases for capital prosecution, said, yeah, he's right. Professor Bald is absolutely right. There's not an issue here. We're not going to contest this. But we have to accept it. We have to understand that we cannot achieve perfection in the administration of justice. If we demand perfection in the administration of justice, and they were talking about racial perfection, that would be the end of the justice system. We would have to figure out a new way to do everything. So there's almost, it's like, almost like creating a space in which we can talk about race. So um, on the other hand, it's kind of hard to ignore. Uh, normally, I show lots of slides and regression figures and maps and so on and so forth. This is the only set of numbers you're going to see. Um, it's, you know, I just picked one out of the air. I think everybody here 
particularly criminologists, but also other people in the popular uh, whose, whose work is in law and other realms have seen charts of racial disparity, and there are huge charts of racial disparity. Um, this one gives you an idea about the magnitude of the effects. It goes back to 2000. If you try to trace this back to the 1970s, uh, it wasn't terribly different at the outset of the 70s. So two things happened with the big incarceration buildup. One was the big incarceration buildup. Second was the big racial disparity in the incarceration buildup. But that's a topic for a different paper. Um, so just to put things in perspective, there's nearly a million African-American men in prison, roughly about 400,000 Hispanic men. Uh, one of the three black men have some kind of a criminal case. Uh, they're either on probation or parole, they're in detention awaiting trial, or they're in prison awaiting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of this comes out of just a really a very recent mid-year uh, BJS report. So uh, there is a big issue about race that we can't really ignore. Um, the point of the paper is to, to go through two things. One is to show the historical arc that got us what I believe that implicates race in the current patterns of criminal justice administration today, over and above crime. I think it's important to say every time we think about this, uh, we constantly have to keep in the back of our minds, is there a race effect over and above what we understand based on base rate differences in crime? And, and the argument is there is, and um, we will see it over time. Um, I, in the paper, I will show it with a variety of studies, but I think in the t limited time here, I'm not going to get into the details on that. So uh, one point of the paper is to think about how we, move, wh how we got here and the extent to which that arc of history that got us here uh, can lead us to think about what to do in the next 25 to 50 years. Um, I have a sense that what got us here is actually quite relevant to how we might think about digging ourselves out of a, a complicated, uncomfortable racial picture. So um, we're going to ask questions about uh, the, whoops, sorry. This is basically the structure of the paper. Um, we ask the historical questions. Um, second, I uh, want to think carefully about how to specify this over and above the effect of race point. We'll talk a little bit about that. I want to focus today on the explanatory frameworks. There are several, um, and I think they're important to understand because that gives us the policy entry uh, and practice entry into thinking what to do and where we might want to amass more evidence. And then think about how we think about law and using law as an instrument to correct this. Right now, we're not using law to correct it, but um, in fact, the law is biased against uh, uh, being a part of the correction process. But uh, we want to think a little bit about how that happened. So in the paper, we talk about um, a variety of stages or um, through which um, race has worked its way into the picture. The reason I start out with slave patrols is something very simple. In the work we're doing in New York on racial profiling, uh, we've had a, doing a lot of interviews with kids around the city, we were in focus groups and so on and so forth, and one day about a year ago, a kid says in a focus group, man, the cops treat me like I'm a runaway slave. Boing. So this goes off. And I start thinking about slave patrols and everything I'd read before about slave patrols. Um, slave patrols have a really interesting period in American history um, uh, without getting, again, without getting into the real, to the gory details of it. They go, they number back to the early, even the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, but they progressed through the period of Reconstruction especially. They were the forerunners of modern policing in the U.S. Um, and they gave rise over time as public police replaced private police and slave patrols. They gave rise to Ku Klux Klan chapters and other privatized forms of justice, uh, which gave rise in turn to lynchings, which is part of, uh, I think, that kind of racialized regime. So slave patrols are not an unimportant way to think about the posturing um, of, of official justice with respect to African Americans. Um, the second phase is a phase of weird science. Uh, weird science, by weird, weird, for those of you who have kids or are of a certain age, you'll remember a TV show on Nickelodeon called Weird Science. Um, and by weird science, I mean a couple of specific things. One is the, simply the uh, classic Lombrosian arguments. Um, and I think maybe it's best to understand it in terms of Lombroso, because one of the things that Lombroso did was, um, it, Lombroso picked up this, a, a scheme from Madison Grant who talked about Nordicism and wanting to continue a process of whitening the white race and on this continent. Uh, he talked about, um, uh, well, pursuing that almost as public policy. Um, Lombroso, for all of the other stuff he did, at the end of the day, um, he talked about 
um, he, I have a quote here about, he went on to suggest that the abnormalities are most frequently observed in the skulls of the colored and inferior races. Um, and he winds up ending the first edition of his book by making an argument about the inferiority of, um, that's of colored races grounded in biology, uh, grounded in atavism, and so on and so forth. Um, the Kimbrough case is interesting because it kind of replicates that bad science theme. In the Kimbrough case, they talked about the crack baby research, which was remarkable. You know, and New York, in a sense, was ground zero for the crack epidemic and living in New York then. Um, and you could just see the headlines about um, crack destroys maternal instinct. That was one of the, the headlines in the New York Post one day. Um, all of the, my sister was a teacher in the New York City public schools and talked about how they were trained um, almost monthly to expect this horrible cohort of children who would emerge and create all kinds of trouble in the classroom and so on. All of this turned out to be untrue. Uh, so it's very much, this kind of historical arc is, is probably not um, terribly unreasonable to think about. Um, third is uh, some of the science that infused itself into the wars on drugs. And wars, I mean multiple wars. If you go back to Harrison, there's lots of talk at the time of the Harrison Act about the superhuman strength of, of Negroes when they would ingest cocaine. Uh, the racial dimensions of the opium wars um, involving Asian Americans and their insidious uh, infection of white American women with opiate addiction. Um, Hispanics and marijuana um, leading up in part to the dialogue around the Marijuana Reform Act um, during that period in the 1930s. Um, so there's much to say about the various wars and drugs and kind of the racial indifference if you think about the modern era and passing the 100 to 1 disparity and so forth, particularly kind of negligence for not thinking about the bad science that drove some of that, that legislation. Um, the, war, the urban dystopia refers to the um, riots of the 1960s, which is a very big turning point, uh, partly having to do some with some of the eras that Michael talks about. Um, there were riots in um, roughly 257 cities. Uh, the Kerner Commission talked about uh, the larger cities, but there were actually riots in 257 cities. Many of them were repeats. Um, LA was probably the archetypal, LA, Detroit, and Newark were the three archetypal ones. If you read the narratives in the first 50 pages of the Kerner Commission report, the riots almost invariably were sparked by something that the police did in a black community to a black person that would set off a spark that was just simply waiting to ignite. Um, and they're very, very, um, they're very powerful narratives and kind of scary. Um, but when you read about some of the responses to the riots in LA, uh, they're very interesting. So um, uh, Governor Brown commissioned something called the, the, the um, uh, McCone Commission. And the McCone Commission was made up of, uh, I think, eight prominent white businessmen two African-American businessmen, uh, nobody who had any particular political affiliation, none of, the, none of them. Um, and they kind of basically, they were, a little, they were terribly sympathetic to some of the underlying social welfare explanations for the riots. They basically talked about um, bad, bad actors for the most part. Uh, Reagan steps into the act, um, uh, talks about Negro hoodlums. Uh, the police chief in Los Angeles, who was um, Chief Parker at the time, talks about monkeys in the zoo. And this is all on the record. So you can imagine, um, these, are, these are terribly salient comments. We can talk about, Larry talked about System 1. It kind of, if you think about the interaction between emotion and System 1, this really does get into the cultural DNA. And it's very hard to scrub it out once it gets in. Um, you can see a little bit of that in some of the language about danger. That's, if you read Supreme Court cases, particularly on criminal procedure, the dangers of the war on drugs, the dangers of what happens in particular communities that are infected with drugs and so on. You don't have to name the communities because the epidemiology is going to point you there. But the language that's used is not terribly, it's a little bit more civilized than talking about monkeys in the zoo. But it's really pretty harsh language. Um, and then we're in the era of mass incarceration. And um, there's lots to talk about there. If you, Michelle Alexander's book is an interesting book. It's not the best scientific book in the world. As a polemic, it's extremely effective. I think she marshals arguments in a really interesting way. Michael's written about this quite eloquently. Um, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I think the evidence is, is, is there. But we are now in that era, um, maybe not coming out of it if we look at some of the graphs in terms of the very, very slow uh, decline in the prison population relative to the very large decline in the crime rate. So these are the historical arcs. And the question is how well they connect up from the past to the present 
and then ultimately how we think about their connection to the future. And that's really what um, uh, part of, an important part of what the paper will be. Um, I'm going to talk also in the paper and do talk starting, uh, starting to talk about racial disparities in criminal justice processing. Um, and there's a, quite a, a lot to say about it, and the data keeps getting better and better over time. Um, writing this paper 10 years ago would have been a little bit more speculative than writing it today when I think there's a lot better information available. Um, so we do have base rate differences, and they're real. They're concentrated in particular neighborhoods. I think it's important to think about neighborhoods in an explanatory frame. Um, Rob Sampson has written uh, a very interesting piece about Chicago. In his book on Chicago, he talks about how the worst neighborhoods always remain the worst neighborhoods, uh, even in times when things are getting better. Um, so there's base rate differences are not just at the individual level, but at people situated in context. There's base rate differences by context, in other words. But you begin to see the production of disparity when you look at some of the emerging data about ratios of crimes to arrest. In New York, we do something very, very simple to array the data about the police stops. Phil, somebody mentioned the fact that there's 700,000. I think we're going to actually hit eight this year. Um, so there's 800,000 stops. You would think that the stops would be allocated proportionately to crime. Um, if you actually display the, 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 you break the city down into, say, 10 percentiles based on the crime rates, and you look at the number of stops per crime, the number of stops per crime actually aren't, isn't the same. You would think this simple metric would be the same, but it's not. In the safer parts of the city, there's very relatively low rates of stops per crime. In the highest crime neighborhoods in the city, there's, there's the, I think the index is something like four or five times the number of stops. If you break it down by race, you get the same phenomenon. More stops per crime based on what we understand to be race-specific crime rates. So there is something about a focus of policing efforts on race independent of even the base rates of crime. And this is one of the beginnings. We see this also in arrest patterns. And we see it in particular, something in New York that I think is replicated around the country, which is uh, patterns based of, of patterns of marijuana arrests, which is a very interesting gateway phenomenon, entry into the system, easy to get a quick record, and so on. So um, this one particular in index, I think, is telling us a lot about um, how the process starts. There's lots of evidence of disparate impact and disparate treatment. I use those terms separately. They have different legal meanings. Um, um, but I th we'll talk a little bit in the paper about the way that you get to those two different things. I think they require two different kinds of algorithms and two different analytic frameworks. Um, but you can imagine the disparate impact. And we see it in data that's come out now about sentencing, about charging. There's a very interesting paper on federal charging that's done by Sonia Starr and her colleagues at Michigan. They analyzed a lot of federal sentencing guideline data. And in those data, they showed that uh, pound for pound, prior record offense severity, um, or, or facts of the case, weights of drugs, for example, that there are racially disparate, sentence, racially disparate charges which puts you at a different starting point in the guidelines uh, for blacks relative to whites and Hispanics relative to whites. Um, and there's some state data that's emerging around that as well. We see racial disparities in how kids are waived to the criminal court, where there is discretion, whether it's discretion for the prosecutor or whether it's discretion in the courtroom by a judge in an adversarial heating, hearing. We still see that coming up as well. Um, and so the question I keep coming back to, and this is the one that I think is the empirical portion of the paper, to try and figure out just what is the unique contribution. Um, there's an interesting phenomenon. If you look at some of the sentencing data um, and work by people like Daryl Steffensmeyer, by, by Michael and others, um, if you go back in 1980 or so and you look at the sentencing disparity data as best it existed, uh, you'd see a pretty, pretty strong correlation between crime or the nature of the crime, the severity of the crime, and the prison sentence whether it was the in-out decision or whether it was sentence length. If you take those data and push it forward 25 years, um, that perfect correlation is hardly perfect anymore and probably only explains maybe about half of the variance in prison sentences. So there's something, uh, the racial difference in prison sentences. So there's something about race that's now entered into the picture, again, over and above any base rate differences in crime to explain some of that prison growth phenomenon. Um, and that's essentially where we're going with respect to that. There are issues about the uses of pretrial detention, which has a very um, important biasing effect on what happens to cases as they move through the system. Um, there's data on sentencing and so on and so forth. Um, the, the fun and scary part of the paper is to think about um, what are the explanatory frameworks that would lead us into this position. 
One is bias. Now, Jerry Skolnick talked many years ago about the symbolic assailant. Uh, the symbolic assailant is basically what Trayvon Martin was, right? He was a symbolic assailant. And Zimmerman took off and got a black guy in a hoodie. Um, so you can imagine how that nar narrative works, for those of you who are not familiar with it. Let me tell you a little bit about two very quick experiments. My colleagues in the MacArthur Juvenile Justice Network, Sandra Graham and her student Brian Lowry, did a study where they took uh, two groups of people, probation officers and police officers in separate components, randomly assigned them to two different groups. In one group, they gave them a bunch of racial primes. Uh, uh, dreadlocks, hip hop music, baggy pants. And in the other group, they gave them neutral primes, haircuts, uh, uh, blue jeans, and whatever. Uh, then they gave them a crime narrative, and then they asked these people in the respondent, the, the respondents in the two different groups, to evaluate the blameworthiness of a racially ambiguous defendant or perpetrator in a case. And you can imagine what the results were. Given the racial prime, this is talk about system one, given the racial prime, um, the attributions of blameworthiness were far more severe uh, for those who were primed with the racial primes. Um, they didn't do it with a Hispanic condition, to the best of my knowledge, right? They didn't lift that off. Um, uh, the, the, Jennifer Eberhardt has done kind of the same thing using something, it was a study called Looking Death Worthy, where she looked at death sentencing, um, even within an African American population, based on uh, the intensity of what she refers to as Negroid features. So the darker the skin, the more stereotypically, quote, Negro, the greater the attributions of uh, death worthiness with respect to a defendant in a capital case. So there's a very long line of experimental work showing that these are very, very strong, fairly deep biases. Some people think it's simply the reproduction of other disadvantage, and to some extent that's true. If you actually show a map of low birth weight, and we, and we do this in New York City, low birth weight, um, school dropout, foster care placements, applications for homelessness, police stop and frisk, and so on and so forth, it's all the same map. So in a sense, there's a reproduction of disadvantage that's happening there. Um, there's lots of racial conflict and racial threat. There's a really interesting study that showed up in a mediocre journal, but it's a very good study about um, police allocations of budgets and how policing budgets um, seem to increase um, across the board. Uh, net of crime rates, controlling for crime, when the racial composition of the population tends to be darker. Um, this was done in a series of California cities. It's a really interesting paper. In our work on capital punishment in New York, um, sorry, around the country that I did with Jim Liebman, we showed that the error rates, the, the false production of death sentences, was far greater in counties that where, where the um, two factors were happening. The black-white crime, the black-white homicide ratios were greater, so there was a racial threat. And where there was simply an imbalance in population, the greater the black population in a county, the greater the production of false death sentences. So there's a lot to be said about the role of racial conflict. Um, I'm going to skip over these except for re institutional design. Um, in the city of Cincinnati, for example, um, which had really severe riots um, within the past decade, um, for 90 years, three, all the police chiefs in that city came from three German high schools or German, German population high schools on the west side of Cincinnati. It's a continued reproduction. Um, and the command ranks of the police department were exceedingly white. In New York City, the command ranks, for all of the diversity that's happened to the police department in New York City, the command ranks are roughly 10% non-white, even though the force itself is roughly 50%. So you can imagine how the stories go about institutional design and what norms get signaled and what don't get signaled. And just very quickly, um, for law professors in the room, if you read Armstrong, um, if you read McCleskey, if you go back to Washington v. Davis, the remedies through the courts for this, for, to remedy discrimination are very much foreclosed. I, I'm not quite sure I see the way out, but I would defer to others on that. And so if you take all of this, you take the bias at the start, and then all the other stuff, um, it's not unreasonable to hypothesize that bias has a multiplicative effect on all those other things. So uh, just let's finish up on what the opportunities are to kind of undo this. Um, there are lots of experiments going in now on debiasing. Um, Philip Goff, who is a very interesting young African-American um, social psychologist, is working actually in police departments trying to do debiasing experiments. He's actually onto something really interesting where he talks about the prominence of masculinity threat in explaining racially biased behavior by police officers. 
And uh, for you cultural theorists in the room, you can run with that one. I certainly will in the paper. Um, neighborhoods change. We know there's a lot of neighborhoods in New York City that have changed profoundly, um, both in terms of composition. Um, immigration has had a big effect. Immigration itself is a racial and ethnicity phenomenon. Um, we, I think there's much to be learned about what happens in neighborhoods when ethnicity and race change um, as circumstances change. And I think there's something really interesting. I'm never one to cite television, other than maybe The Wire. Um, but if you actually go on the CNN website and look at the series that Anderson Cooper just did on race, it's really, really good. Because he interviews little kids, and there are profound early childhood manifestations of some kind of racial bias, both among black kids who he interviewed and white kids who he interviewed. This is really actually very, very good and I hope my psychology colleagues will pick this stuff up and run with it. So, I'm out of time? Okay. But not for questions. Okay. <laughs>Hi, Mark Ozzi with the Council on Crime and Justice here in Minneapolis. I thought I heard you say that you find racial disparities have actually increased in the, over the last 20 years or so, um, net of crime, so despite... The, it, it's a, the one area where I think this has been done well um, in terms of social science, in terms of criminology, is in sentencing. And whereas um, my reading of the data is that um, back around roughly 1980 or so, uh, you get a pretty strong prediction of sentencing um, uh, any, any racial disparities in sentencing by differences in crime rates, uh, racial disparity in type of crime um, to, in particular. Um, if you move forward 25 years, you can only predict half of the difference in terms of charge severity and prior record. So there's something else entering into the racial disparity equation other than base rates in crime. Could that be because of the increase in drug sentencing, which we know use of drugs is fairly level across race? I, I think the work that I've read on this actually takes charge into account, so it's drug selling as well as other kinds of crimes. Hi, my name is Mark Miller. I'm a, a private uh, criminal defense attorney. You, when you cite the war on drugs, is there kind of a, a subset of that, the, the post-Len bias era? Uh, Len bias was the number two draft choice for the Boston Celtics I, who took cocaine once and, and that how his I, death was actually co-opted by, of all people, uh, Tip O'Neill and, and the Democrats and it sort of started a, a, a spiraling, uh, or I guess a snowball of, of horrible outcomes with respect to sentencing and I guess, it, you know, using the death of a black man to in, in fact perpetrate uh, very disproportionate sentencing. Well, there's, there's an interesting story around that. Um, one is, I, I actually remember Len Bias playing, he was a fantastic ball player, University of Maryland, for those of you who didn't, didn't remember. Um, it happened before crack, Len, Len was uh, using powder, I don't know if he was freebasing or, or snorting cocaine, but it wasn't crack. Um, within a year or two, crack had sort of emerged as this phenomenon. Um, but when you look at actually, so there's two different levels of this. One is the federal level. If you go back, and I actually had my research assistants pull this for this paper, if you read the statements um, in the hearings when the crack, when crack disparity became, was part of the um, 1986 act, um, Charlie Rangel and Major Owens, two African-American congressmen from New York City, were the strongest voices demanding very, very harsh federal sentencing guidelines. They didn't know what else to do. And um, that, that basically took the phenomenon you're saying about exploitation, legitimated it, and they ran with it. But the other was the states. Mario Cuomo did exactly the same thing. Um, and the African-American state delegations in New York, the state assembly, and the state senate, were right alongside Charlie Rangel and Major Owen. So it wasn't just the feds. This was something that was replicated in virtually every state house in the country, including Illinois. I don't know what happened here, um, but California, Illinois, New York, Pennsylvania, all had the same phenomenon that followed very closely on the federal leadership. Brian Spahn, University of Nebraska, Omaha. Um, Nebraska recently re, uh, released their uh, DMC report, and uh, one of my colleagues is uh, trying to deal with stakeholder response and 
um, meeting with police departments and, and things of this issue. And uh, so I guess one question is, uh, you know, the approach that she's taken is just stick to the numbers. So when a police department says this isn't true, <coughs> you gave us the data, let's sit down, let's look at the data again. Um, so I, I guess a little bit of, you know, if you have any suggestions for that, but also um, police departments are pointing to the schools. And I don't know if, if any of the work that you've been doing um, has taken that into account, but they say, well, we get a lot of what the data is showing is that these are the kids we get from the schools. So it's the schools that in their policies have the racial bias, and then we just have to deal with uh, what the schools are sending our direction. Well, because a couple of things. One, um, I for a long time thought it was really just rhetoric and a polemic to talk about the school to prison pipeline, which I think a lot of advocates talk about. And then I started looking at school discipline data. And then the Department of Education came out with this really very interesting, compelling study about racial disparities in the allocation of discipline, um, which kind of pre is a, an early stage of leading to school dropout or school failure. So I, I think there is something to say to that. But there's something really interesting, um, and, and this brings up one of the things that we'll talk about in the paper. One of the disadvantages of basically in juror bias, uh, bias both within juries during deliberation, but also simply in the selection and construction of jurors. So in the North Carolina Racial Justice Act just concluded with the, at their first case, Judge Weeks in North Carolina found in favor of the, the guy on death row um, using Barbara O'Brien's study and said there is really strong, compelling, rock solid statistical evidence of bias in the use of preemptory challenges um, and in voir dire generally. And um, the judge basically accepted this as an adjudicative fact, right? So um, what are the, the response of the prosecutors were, well, wait a minute, that's just numbers. You can't tell me that this phenomenon of who you decide to keep on the jury can be explained by numbers. Um, there's much more to jury selection. There's things like maybe you know, thinking about Larry's example in the morning, looking the guy in the eye and trying to read somebody's face. This is what, but, but if you think that my stuff about bias is right, not mine, but Sandra's and everybody else's is right, then how you look at somebody and decide whether they should be on the jury or not is something different. But I go back and say something like this. Um, in Philadelphia, in the district attorney's office many years ago, uh, one of the ADAs, a guy named Jack McMahon, not the basketball player, um, who played for the Cincinnati Royals, I think. Um, shows how old I am. Anyway, McMahon filmed, made a videotape of how to train his deputies to keep black people off death juries. Very straightforward. I actually have the tape. I show it to my, my, my criminal law class every year. Um, it's phenomenal. Um, but I think it speaks to the question about um, uh, it's, you know, there's something really kind of systemic in the functioning of the institution, but at the same time, and this is sort of like climate denial, right? We just, we, here's the facts, we just, you know, I don't believe the facts, right? I'm just gonna deny it. And I'm not quite sure what the cultural inroad is to get people to get back to the age of enlightenment and you know, deal with the facts on the table. Any more questions? We're in the back, we have to wrap it up. Thanks, uh, Kay Lane Boelison. Oh private attorney. I just had a quick clarification question about when you were talking about the ratios of crime to arrest. I thought you said that in communities where the crime rate is uh, low, the arrest rate is low, and in communities where it's high, it's high. I, I'm not sure why that shows there's a disparity. Um, maybe I misspoke. In the, the ratio of arrests to crime is much greater in minority neighborhoods than in white neighborhoods. So um, police are much more likely to exercise their discretion, particularly at low-level crimes where you could really go either way, or um, as Larry said in his slide this morning, use a move-along authority. Instead, the, 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 the default is to arrest, whereas in white neighborhood, the default is not to arrest. And that's be the, one of the beginnings of the production of disparity. And we kind of see the same thing in terms of ratio of just using Terry stops. Fourth Amendment stops. So it's, it's, it's just more stops per crime. There's, more, there's heavier, more intensive, more intrusive, more formal policing, less exercise of discretion in minority neighborhoods. Jeffrey, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>